The patriarch Jacob, after a mysterious dream in which the presence of the Lord was made manifest to him, being seized with a holy fear, cried out, How terrible is this place! This is the house of God in the gate of heaven. Now these two designations, which apply so well to our churches, remind us of two obligations which concern priests and people alike, namely, to respect and to love the house of God. Now, firstly, our churches are the houses of God in those places such as this, uh, missions and chapels, what have you, that we do our blessing these times to dedicate to God. They belong to him first and foremost. Now, when, uh, now when Solomon, surrounded by all the people of Israel, dedicated to the Almighty the magnificent temple which he had built, the splendor of the ceremonies, and the divine majesty which filled the house and was sensibly felt, it filled the assembly with such a profound feeling of religious awe that they prostrated themselves to the ground and cried out with their king, Is it credible, then, that God should dwell with men on earth? Now we, too, should experience like feelings of awe every time we enter a church if we were thoroughly impressed with the sense of these words, This is the house of God. Now, yes, really, it is God's house. It has been consecrated to him. He has accepted it at, as his abiding place upon earth. Therefore, he manifests, from this he manifests his divine presence. Now to the eye of faith, how marvelous is the beauty of even the humblest church, especially when that church is privileged, uh, the small chapel, what have you, uh, have the, our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament dwelling there. Now religion alone inspired the thought of rearing it. Now religion gathered the materials, laid the foundations, raised the walls. It was, it was completed, it was decorated, but it was not yet the house of God. It became his temple on the day when the church, by solemn prayers and consecrations, separated it from the profane uh, edifices and dedicated it to divine worship. Then was offered there the sacrifice of the lamb without spot. And then the Savior came to take possession of it, not to abide there transitorily only, but to make it his permanent home. So, uh, it is, now, by his, but he made it his home by the continual presence of, of him in the Blessed Sacrament, being here present with us. So, what a privilege many of our, our places have of having him there, what do you call it, uh, residing in the Blessed Sacrament. Not all the places we go to Mass, as you probably know, uh, is fortunate to have a building. Uh, and most of that have a building because there are, uh, either the priests there or people nearby, we are able to leave the Blessed Sacrament reserved for when people want to make visits. So feel very special, uh, privileged to have such a place as this and others close by that you can come to and make visits to our Lord. Now, as a monarch, though sovereign in all his realms, Yet, was, has pal yet has palaces in certain places where he receives the homage of his subjects, gives audiences, and more immediately exercises her his authority. So a king or someone in charge, they have uh, several places that they can go and hold court, so to speak. And now, so also God has such things, who is everywhere present by his essence, his power, and his providence. He willed to have temples wherein to dwell among men, to receive the public worship due to him and to accomplish the great designs of his mercy. Now, is it not especially in our churches that our divine Savior continues his work of redemption? Does he not still enlighten the blind, heal the sick, restore the dead to life? To each our temples, but in a much higher sense than to the temple of Solomon, applies the words of our Lord. I have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. My eyes also shall be open and my ears attentive to the prayer of him that shall pray in this place. And my eyes and my heart may remain there perpetually. Now what follows therefore, but that no place in the whole universe deserves so much veneration as this chosen temple of God. Now the Catholic sanctuary is much more worthy of reverence than the ancient tabernacle. Now can the manna be compared to the most august of our sacraments, the blessed sacrament? Now, my, my, now, uh, 
Oh my God, has this always been my conduct? One should ask themselves how they have behaved. Now if guiltless of exterior irreverences to thy supreme majesty in thy house, how has it been with regard to the interior recollection of my soul, with distractions or what have you? My body and my lips have paid the exterior homage, but my heart has often been far from thee. Therefore may thy, thy adorable presence so occupy my whole mind that in thy holy temple I may think of, of nothing but thee. Now the temple of God, says St. Nicholas, is a most heavenly place. When we are there, we should not allow ourselves a thought or an action that savors of earth. So that is something you come to pray, obviously at Mass and petition, give thanksgiving, adoration, and uh, what have you, uh, but uh, we don't bring the worldly thoughts here. Obviously, our petitions, when it's uh, the proper place, uh, we're going to talk about some things that we have to deal with, but the world, we should be thinking God first and foremost, and not be thinking of things that are uncontrollable. Say our prayers, and then focus on what's coming, what is happening here at Holy Mass, or spending that special time with our Lord. Now, our churches are the gate of heaven, therefore we should love them. Now it is by grace that we gain heaven, and all sources of grace are open for us in the sacred temples of the church. At her baptismal fonts, we were first invested with that noble robe of innocence which made us children of God, brothers and co-heirs of Jesus Christ, for before we were ch children of wrath. Now in her tribunals of mercy, the confessional, our sins are remitted, and all our rights to our heavenly inheritance are restored to us. Now in her tabernacles dwells the sanctifier of our souls, ever ready to lavish his blessings on us. Now at her holy tables we receive the bread of angels, the principal in, principal in pledge of our glorious immortality. And her altars are a new calvary, on which the great victim daily renews the mystery of our redemption. And from her pulpits, God teaches and exhorts us, for to hear his minister is to hear himself. And as you know, save uh, extraordinary circumstances, uh, the, the sacrament of confirmation is administered in a church as far as possible, and the holy oils that we use uh, for, for baptism, confirmation, extreme unction, they are at that special mass on Holy Thursday, the Chrism Mass, uh, the mass uh, where the priest, the bishop, blesses oils held, of course, in the church when at all possible. Now, the church, therefore, is for every Christian the antechamber of heaven. If enemies persecute him, there he finds refuge. In this arsenal, he finds whatever weapons he needs for his defense. Yet the favor he desires be what it may, the house of God is always the house of prayer and a prayer heard more readily. So that's why, when possible, if you can pr say some prayers in church, some uh, aids you need from God, it can be more readily heard here when it's possible to get here. Uh, when you're having that great choice, ability to do that, you should do that. Now, great then must be the attraction which the church has for the man of faith. A thrill of joy pervades his heart when he hears the invitation, let us go to the house of the Lord. And so, you know, that is, uh, what do you call it, should impel us to make visits as much as we can. Now, in order never again to fail in reverence for this house of God, uh, uh, now one should say to themselves, this is none other than the house of God in the gate of heaven. So have that on your mind. If you're being distracted, pull yourself away. No, i got to remember where I am. This is not just any any. Uh, person having me as a guest at his home, and we got to be respectful in other people's homes. Uh, but no, we have to even be the more here. So uh, remembering why we're here, uh, we should try and focus. Uh, try not to miss get out of mass. Uh, you know, try and do our best to take care of things before mass, so we can be here from start to finish and listen to the priest sermon and what have you. And of course, make it Thanksgiving after Holy Mass, especially since if you received our Lord in Holy Communion. Now, I would just like to say uh, that some, sadly, we know what's happened since Vatican II that they have been misused and desecrated. That that false worship service, the new Mass. 
so-called, has taken over all the Catholic churches that were, were under the domain uh, of our forefathers who had the faith and built them for proper worship of God. Um, and besides what happens with the Novo Soto Mass, so many of them have had uh, worship services with other uh, bodies of, uh, of religion, so to speak. Uh, and of course, Paul VI started that uh, up very much, but John Paul II, who catapulted it to to be an institutionalized, one could say, and he had that massive one in 1986 in Assisi. He took the Basilica of that great saint, uh, St. Francis of Assisi, his body being there, and they actually took over that whole town for several days and invited as many of the world's religions, these false um, manners of worship, those involved with them to come and do their prayers, he being present for many of them in that beautiful basilica. And at one point, even though he himself wasn't there for this, uh, uh, the Buddhists put a Buddha, a statue of their, their Buddha, their, their leader, on top of the tabernacle where the Blessed Sacrament is supposed to be reserved. Thankfully it wasn't because the new mass was being said there. But that is, given that there came uh, the door for that was from Second Vatican Council. It's uh, dec decree on ecumenism, unitatis redintegratio, the restitution of, restoration of unity uh, amongst Christians, but also they had documents concerning the interfaith movement, meaning dealing with other uh, bodies that are not Christians, what have you. So they did their prayers there, and that was under his auspices, his idea. They had control of them churches, he, he wanted that to be done and took part in it and all the other convents and monasteries, uh, they opened their doors to these things to happen. And so obviously, even though they had been desecrated, it was a further insult to God by going against the first commandment that is, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no strange gods before me. And so having these uh, foreign religions come and do their things uh, was not the proper use of, of, of what's happening which should happen in a Catholic church, and we have to be very wary of that. Uh, we probably, many of you have probably had to do this themselves, but um, when things changed, I can think of some stories, a couple of um, a couple of them. There was a, in New York, a, a man I know, he was a boy at that time, around 10, he's actually a priest now, and he and his family were at their local church, which they'd always go to, and uh, the priest up there started to, to touch about some nonsense, and they recognized, the no, uh, what do you call it, that it's not what the church always taught. So this woman, a widow with her ten children, she got right up and she walked out, and other people followed. There were about 200 people who left that church that day because they wouldn't stand up for this. And now what happened here, the priest seeing that, they got busy, they did on the phones, and they called up the different people. So next week, just about save that family, that priest family, and one other family, Maybe about 180 people went back and stayed back over there because whatever reason, they, they could not stay away. They were persuaded by the, the priests there to go back and, uh, what do you call it, which, you know, was a very sad thing. And besides that, uh, ecumenism, just talking about that topic, I, a friend of mine, when he was young, uh, he, even though the family was traditional, they were going to an Eastern Rite church at the time and, uh, there was a strange priest they didn't know in the in the sanctuary right over here where the, the clergy could sit. And so when it's time for the sermon, the priest, the pastor, says, oh, and we welcome this abbot from our nearby Orthodox monastery, uh, so-and-so. And so with that, even though my friend, he was a server in the altar here, the father, not having human respect, knowing what was going on was wrong, he recognized it, he came into the sanctuary, and his son, who was holding a candle, he just took him out and marched the family out, and they didn't go back there anymore because they knew that was not pleasing to God. And some say, even though the Orthodox, they have they have valid sacraments for the most part and believe much of what we do, but no, they are separated from, from the Church of Christ, and so therefore we could have no part in that. So, dear faithful, you know, that's why we have places like here, and you should be thankful for that uh, and to be thankful that you have... Uh, what do you call it, the, the place to come and visit our Lord. Now, knowing that our churches are the uh, houses of God, we should respect them because they are consecrated to him, because he dwells in them and ceases not to manifest his presence in them. Now, they were built for God. Now, after those ceremonies and prayers, which imparted to them a religious character, the holy sacrifice was offered to them, and our Lord took possession of them. From that time, it could be said of the church so consecrated, 
Behold the tabernacle of God with men, and he will dwell with them. Now the real presence of our Lord in the Eucharist is a literal accomplishment of the promise. Behold, I am with you all the days. Jesus Christ is with us in our sanctuaries, and he is not inactive there. Here he continues his work of redemption, enlightening, healing souls, and applying them to the merit to them the merits of his blood. Of now of one of each one of our churches, he says, I have chosen and sanctified this place, that my name may be there. My eyes shall be open and my ears attentive. Now let us understand, dear faithful, that no place in the world is worthy of so much veneration. Henceforth, when entering a church, I shall say with St. Bernard, Stay out, thoughts of earth. This is neither your time nor your place. May our Lord always bless you through his Immaculate Mother. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.